Hello, ladies and gentlemen, just to say we are just waiting for everyone to come in from the waiting room, but we will get underway in a few seconds. So if you could just bear with us for a few seconds, I'm seeing lots of people entering the call uh, and then we will get started. Okay, good afternoon and a very warm welcome to Conference Conversations, an interactive online talk show where we've been discussing the key issues and questions relating to the work of the Conference on the Future of Europe ever since the process began. These conversations are organised under the auspice of the Conference Observatory, a joint initiative by the Bertelsmann Stiftung, the European Policy Centre, the King Baudouin Foundation and the Stiftung Mercator. And they've aimed to observe, critically analyse and inspire the deliberations of the conference and to develop proposals to improve the EU's future participatory and democratic architecture. And we've seen a whole raft of publications uh, on that very point. Uh, I'll mention a few of them later on. My name is Jackie Davis. I've had the privilege of moderating our conversations. Uh, and today we are going to discuss the end of the conference on the future of Europe, or should I perhaps say the end of the beginning, uh, because we are moving from one phase into another. And the key question we want to discuss today is, where do we go from here? This follows, of course, the official closing of the conference and the presentation of the final report with its 49 sets of proposals, more than 320 measures under nine topics, which were presented to the presidents of the three main EU institutions on May the 9th. So as I say, we're going to discuss the content of those proposals and then consider how the results can and will be taken forward. Uh, joining me for this session, I'm hoping, we're still missing one of our guests, uh, but Colin Skikluna, who is head of the Cabinet of European Commission, Vice President for Democracy and Demography and Conference Co-Chair Dubrava Suica. Uh, very pleased to have with us Danielle Freund, MEP, who's a member of the European Parliament's delegation to the conference. We also, as always, have with us Yanis Emanulidis, Director of Studies at the EPC, and and Dominic Hjellemann, senior expert at the Bertelsmann Stiftung. Um, I'll just, I'll come straight to you, Daniel. I'm just looking for news to see whether we know what has happened to Colin. I know he was having a little bit of trouble logging on. Hopefully he'll join us shortly. But can I just ask, uh, by the way of starting uh, all of this, Daniel, before we get into the substance, what's been your overall impression, both of the process and what's emerged? Has it met your expectations, exceeded them, uh, or have you been disappointed by elements of it? What's your overall assessment? Well, thanks, uh, Jackie, for, for having me again for, for this conversation uh, to, to now look back at, at how this all went. I think that under the circumstances, I would say really not that bad. Uh, you know, when I think back about a year ago, how, how this all took off already under difficulties and uh, you know fighting between the institutions particularly us in the parliament and and the member states governments and what what i really think uh, what i'm quite proud of is is that the citizen participation part and i know you know in the democracy and in the participatory uh, field there's lots of small criticism on on some of the elements but i think overall you know, the idea of bringing citizens into the heart of the conference was the right idea. And that part is probably also the part that actually worked best. I, I have to say the, the proposals that the European citizens panels made are more impressive than I had hoped for. Uh, you know, that under such time constraints and the conference was much shorter than we had initially planned, that these panels only met three times on topics that were much vaster than I had hoped. But I think given these circumstances, what the citizens delivered uh, is, is really quite impressive, okay. um, both in, in terms of identifying the right issues, making good recommendations to address them, and that we then in the discussions among the politicians with the citizens actually managed not to just kill everything, but but that uh, you know not only have we preserved pretty much what the citizens 
uh, had proposed, but build on it, improved, added on uh, certain certain elements. So I think what we now have on the table is is a really good outcome that I wouldn't have expected a year ago. Thank you very much. I'd like to come back and maybe ask you to highlight what for you are the key proposals, the ones you find most striking in a moment. But I'm delighted to welcome, he's managed to join us now, Colin Skikluna. I hope I pronounce your name correctly. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I was asking, and I just wanted to, to mention uh, something your boss, Vice President Sweetcher, said at the final plenary. She said, in the wake of the pandemic and with the reality of the brutal war of aggression on European soil, it has been more important than ever to witness democracy at work and citizens in action. We discussed at our last conference conversations the impact of the Ukraine war or potential impact, Colin, but I just really wanted to get a sense from you. It's been more important than ever. Has it lived up to your expectations? Has it exceeded them? What is your overall impression? Daniels is a, a good, a really good outcome and much better than he thought it would be. We'll come on later to what happens next, but your impressions so far. Well, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation and apologies on behalf of the Vice President for, uh, for not being able to join herself. Um, but I, I managed to get the, the tail end of, of, of Daniel's uh, um, uh, introduction and, and I would certainly subscribe to, uh, to, to the views that he expressed. I think that um, you know, there were many different expectations from this, from this process. I mean, if you asked 100 people what they expected out of the conference, you'd probably have got 200 opinions uh, a year ago. Uh, and many of them would not have been particularly um, complimentary ones. Um, however, I think that um, that the way the way things, um, you know, there were there are a number of factors which have meant that ultimately I feel that um, there is a degree of satisfaction in how the process has delivered, um, and that is because uh, different parts of the process feel that they have been able to achieve the objectives that they wished to achieve. Um, I think that um, the um, the citizen part, as as Daniel mentioned, um, is something that that you know was was an experiment. It, 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 it had never been tried at this scale before uh, in a multilingual settle, setting, um, so so there was a degree of risk there, and I think that uh, that ultimately that risk paid off very very handsomely, um, both in terms of the the level of engagement, but also in the quality of uh, of the outcome. Um, and I think yet another experiment was this this plenary, this uh, very very different type of plenary, where you had elected representatives and citizens and civil society, all of them actually sitting together, on equal, you know, on a par with one another. Um, they were all members of this of this plenary in this in the same way, and um, and having that kind of debate uh, was was difficult for some at the beginning, I think, but over time, each plenary, the, uh, the, the, the atmosphere improved, I think, and the kind of debate improved as well. And, and that had an impact on, on how the, the outcome ultimately um, appeared. And, and that's why I think that, uh, that in the end, um, there is, there is a, a significant degree of, of satisfaction in the outcome. There are a number of important lessons to be learned. Not everything was smooth, not everything was perfect, far from it. But I think uh, overall, on a balance, I think um, we would all conclude that, uh, that we're, we're pleased with the outcome. Thank you very much. Um, Dominic, we've often uh, discussed the process as it's gone along. And I think generally speaking, it would be fair to summarize your reactions as normally glass half full, not half empty. Some concerns as we've gone along, but now when we see these 49 sets of proposals, the 320 something measures. Um, are you pleasantly surprised by the final outcome? Uh, has it gone better than you might have thought given at certain moments in the process? I think there were question marks. I, I wouldn't say I'm surprised, um, uh, but overall uh, I'm quite happy with the results. I mean, the German poet Hermann Hesse once wrote, there is beauty in every beginning. With regard to the conference, I would say there is beauty in its ending, not because it finally ended and that, that's why we should all be lucky, but because at the end of the process, its, its potential became finally much clearer to the public, to observers, and at the end it exceeded at least some expectations. Um, uh, of observers that were quite skeptical throughout the process. And I mean, Colin just mentioned a number of 100 people, if you would have asked them. I mean, I would still say if you ask 100 uh, randomly selected citizens from all over Europe, if they had have heard of the conference, 
So you might be lucky to get a single one who have heard of it. So visibility was a, was a problem throughout the process. But at the end, it delivered. It delivered first because it produced many policy ideas. And now um, the European political institutions, they, they have to deal with them. As second, I think there is the clear promise of the, the Commission president that in future, the Commission will give citizens panel more time to deliberate that the Commission will use the new format of citizen participation with key legislative proposals. And finally, um, and, and I'm sure uh, Daniel will be happy about that, uh, so the question uh, of treaty change is back on the table. So we are finally uh, speaking ag again about the institutional setup of the EU and whether the EU is actually fit for purpose. Um, I don't see a convention coming um, we'll in the next, in in the next few while. weeks, but it's back on the table. All right, let's, we'll come to that in a little while, I was going to say, because you say it's back on the table. For some, it's on the table. Others are trying to put it under the table again. Uh, an interesting pre-tussle going on on that discussion. Come back to that in a wee while. But Yanis, complete the picture for us. At this stage, after one year of very intense work, your reaction to the final outcome. Yes, thanks. I will not repeat what has been said because I concur with um, almost everything that has been said. It has been an experiment. I think that um, it has been successful given the framework which it had been pushed into, um, which was the co-responsibility of EU institutions. We know how difficult it was to get to an agreement among the three. Um, and given the framework in which um, the European Citizens Panels, the conference plenary operated, um, I think that this experiment has been a positive experiment. Um, however, having said that, what I now usually say is that actually we will only be able to uh, evaluate the conference in the future. Um, on, in two ways. One, um, what will happen with the proposals recommendations? How will they be translated? Um, will we also reflect on the outcome of the conference in light of what we are now experiencing in the context of the consequences of the war against Ukraine, which I think is a major moment, uh, whether you want to call it watershed, and the new era, whatever you want to call it, it is a major um, moment. Um, so the question is, you know, what happens out with the outcome of the conference in view of that new um, uh, era we live in, um, and also then uh, in terms of citizens' participation in future. Um, the uh, experience of today will be enormously important with what we put in place in order to reform EU democracy in future, and EU democracy needs to reform, needs to be enhanced, um, and involving citizens in that process and I think the conference has clearly showed is an add-on. So we need to take the right lessons. I think Colin mentioned the, the lessons uh, which we need to take out of them. Um, with respect to the citizens dimension, which I think, yes, worked very well, but it can still be improved. Um, the areas which were covered were immense, as Daniel mentioned, just to mention one example. Um, the conference plenary, I think there is still a lot of work to do because we devoted a lot of energy in trying to make sure that we will involve citizens, how to best uh, select them, how to get them involved, um, how to run uh, the, the citizens' patterns. I think we didn't invest enough time into how we merge um, the citizens' dimension and the representative yeah. dimension. Um, and we were talking about this already a year ago that we need to invest more in energy into that, but I think there's a lot which can be learned. So overall, more than half class full. Um, and uh, actually, we still have a lot in front of us also to be able to evaluate how important the conference has been. Absolutely. And later on in this discussion, I'd like to ask you all what will be your key criteria for determining the ultimate success or failure uh, of this experiment. Uh, but before we talk about where we go from here, um, I just wanted to ask, and Colin, coming to you, in terms of the proposals themselves, there's a lot of them, they're very substantive. Um, do you believe, would you highlight any in particular as particularly striking or, or, or and, and overall, do you believe they have the potential to deliver real change and, and achieve that objective of strengthening the EU's capacity to act in an ever more challenging world? Are they, can they really make a difference? Well, I think, I think there's a pretty broad spectrum of, of proposals. I mean, um, first of all, um, you know, I think a, a great deal of attention has been put on the proposals that, uh, that either require or appear to require treaty change. Mm. Um, but in a sense, I think that this uh, distracts away from the, the broader um, achievement here, because I think that many of the perhaps the less striking proposals, but which deal with bread and butter issues, are as important. 
Uh, and in fact, they are the ones that, uh, that in the Commission, we've already started to work on, 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 uh, on trying to implement. Um, and um, so, so I think it's not just about how, um, you know, how far reaching the proposals are. Some of them deal with, with issues which are actually, you know, very mundane, but they are uh, important nonetheless. Um, so, so there's that, there's that aspect. Um, secondly, I think that um, uh, one of the things that is quite striking, and this was one of the things we used to hear quite a bit about at the beginning of the process when there was some um, skepticism about the citizens' panels, if you look at these proposals, some of them may be ambitious, some of them may even be, uh, you know, difficult to implement, but there's nothing outrageous. There's nothing that when you read them, you say, what were they thinking? Um, you know, there is there is a logic, there is a reason to it, and uh, and, and I think this is something which also speaks to 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 the to the process itself. That uh, when you prepare in a, in the right way, then people, even if they are not experts, even if they are not necessarily um, you know very knowledgeable about a particular subject, they are going to come up with ideas and with uh, proposals which make sense. Um, so I think this is this is also something that we we we, we should retain from the from this experience. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't necessarily point to to one more than another because I, I really think that uh, it's true that that uh, we may have been over ambitious in putting literally any subject imaginable on the table, uh, and it would have been far better, I think, for the process itself had we been more selective. But I think, given the political context, had we started choosing one rather than another, um, we would have been in difficulty from the very beginning. And so I think uh, given the nature of the process, we had to be sweeping. Uh, and hopefully if we ever do anything like this again, we might be able to learn that lesson as well. I was going uh, to say, we would like to come back on whether, uh, and, and the EPC, the high level advisory group to the conference observatory, uh, co-chaired by uh, Herman Van Rompuy and Bridget Laffan, has suggested how you might use it in a more targeted way in the future. We'll come back on that later. Um, and, and as you say, there has been this focus on the treaty change. Janos Kapati from our audience, editor of Club Radio Budapest, says, how do you see the chances of substituting the unanimity principle with qualified majority in foreign policy issues? Do you expect more examples of enhanced cooperation in those areas? So already the question's all linking to the treaty change question. But Daniel, Colin arguing there, let's not get hung up on that. There's a lot of substantive important things that are happening that can happen without treaty change. Would you agree with that? What would you highlight? in particular? Obviously, there's lots of stuff that we can do without treaty change. Uh, there is also very big, there might be some things that you can do with ordinary legislative procedure that might actually be more complicated than, than some changes to the treaties. There is, for example, the proposal to completely overhaul the EU's agricultural policy something that I think, uh, you know, the institutions have tried uh, for the better part of the last half century. <laughs> and, you know, still it, it needs a lot of work. So, so there are those, but one might argue that some, at least some of the biggest proposals do require treaty change. So I would, you know, not dismiss obviously everything we can do by legislation or by changing the budget or, you know, other ways. But for me, whether we do attempt to change the treaties is a bit of a measure, whether we take all the recommendations seriously and don't just put those that are more ambitious on the side and say, well, those we look at, uh, you know, in yeah. five years time. Or do, something. do you believe what's emerged really does have the capacity to change the EU to make it more effective? Absolutely. If we resolve these arguments, we'll come back to the arguments about treaty change or not, but taken as they are, do they have the yeah. capacity to have real impact? I mean, absolutely, because they, I mean, it depends as well a bit how you read them. Some of the, the proposals are somewhat vague, right? They say one should reflect on or we should. Uh, I mean, if you take one of the recommendations again, where it's about more investment in common infrastructure, in education, one might say, you know, a euro does the trick, you know, then we have invested more. Uh, but I don't think that that was quite what citizens had in mind. But when you think about, you know, what what is necessary to invest, for example, to make, mitigate climate change, is that 100 billion? Is it 300 billion? I mean, we don't really know. 
and citizens weren't as specific as saying this is the amount we we want to see so in a way there will also in the coming month be somewhat of a, a battle over the interpretation of Absolutely. what citizens what the conference really wanted with any of these uh, recommendations and the question there would be who uh, will be participating in that battle of interpretation how's it going to work but we'll come back on that yanis for you overall these proposals could really see a different sort of European Union emerge? How significant, how, as it struck, struck by what Colin said, none of them are outrageous, but a lot of them are quite far reaching. Well, let's assume that by miracle, all the, all the proposals and recommendations will be implemented uh, over the upcoming period. Obviously, the EU will be a better place. It will become more efficient. It will become more effective. And I think a lot of the deficiencies we're seeing at the European level would be taken care of. Now, we know that we don't live in that kind of a world. Um, and what uh, Daniel was implicating with respect to agriculture policy was a very good example. Um, but however, if you look at to the entirety of the proposal, yes, there are very pro-European, they're very pro-integrationists. Um, and that's why all those who now sometimes argue that the conference was uh, became hijacked uh, of certain positions, uh, the European Parliament uh, being better represented in the final outcome. Well, if you have a position which is pro-integration is pro-European, yes, you will be reflected more in the outcome of these kind of, uh, like, like these kind of experiments, like the conference involving citizens participating in them. Um, and if other 800 would have participated at the same time, I think the outcome would have been also very ambitious compared to what others, especially member states, some, the majority of member states would want in the council. Um, but you are asking about which of the proposals are more significant. Um, and I think that, um, Colin gave a wise reaction, saying that at the end of the day, it depends on how you look at them, and they all have a value in themselves, and I would fully subscribe to them. However, having said that, we are living, as I said earlier, in very particular times. Um, we are facing a new situation, a new era at Zeitmende, again, whatever you want to call it. And I think that now needs to be also one of the filters we apply in identifying what we need to do with respect to the outcome of the conference in light of the experience and the consequences of the war in Ukraine. And if you go through the list, um, and it is a very long list of proposals and, and, and recommendations, I think that there are some that you can signal out. Uh, for example, with respect to uh, climate change and green transition, uh, when it comes to uh, reducing dependency uh, of the EU uh, in economically strategic sectors, uh, if you look into reduct uh, reducing dependency in the energy sector, and I could go on, also some of the governance questions, um, which uh, would require some of them uh, treaty changes, uh, concrete treaty changes, I think this would be a filter to apply to identify what is more important at the current stage, um, and I think that that's something we still need to do in order to make sure that the conference will lead us and help us to create the po political pressure we need to do a lot of the homework we need to do in light of the new era we live in. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to come to Dominic and then I want to go out to the audience to Calypso Nicolaidi. So I'll come to you in a moment, Calypso, but Dominic. Yes, uh, I mean, Colin just used the formulation that perhaps um, the organizers, the institution were a bit too over ambitious with regard to the broad range of topics. Uh, uh, and of course, that created problems. Um, I think that's a bit euphemistic because it would have been much easier, of course, um, in a, um, if, if uh, the conference panels or the conference uh, itself would have dealt with one specific topics. But when I look into the topics, I also must say that um, a lot of people ask me, what is the most innov innovative idea? And I think it's not about innovative ideas. So the conference was more a, a common reflection uh, on already existing polities, a common deliberative reflection on where the EU should be heading. And I'm not a policy expert in all the fields that were tackled, of course, but when I look for, for threats of argumentation, um, so what I see is, as Janis just said, that um, there is this integration as few, Europe is good, but could be better. But there is also, uh, in a lot of recommendations, a clear hint that we should be paying respect to different national cultures and traditions. Subsidiarity is quite often mentioned. Secondly, so very often in a lot of pro proposals, so there is a kind of awareness gap mentioned that citizens want to know more about European policies, about, po about development, about policy making but they just do not know it. So there needs to be new ways of communication. So that is very often said. 
then I think Europe is concrete, yes, but there is there is a lot of the recommendations uh, that say we need to be even more concrete. They talk about uh, bicycle lanes or food packaging. So very concrete mm -hmm. things uh, that, that have found their way into the papers. Uh, overall, there is, of course, um, I think uh, what is interesting, the the will, uh, well, from citizens, but also from the conference plenary, that Europe has a played role in the areas of health and yeah. education. So these are the two topics uh, that are really important and uh, where we do not have that much competences okay. uh, at this point of Thank time. You. And finally, sorry, just finally, again, of course, I think the biggest impact is all in the area of democracy. Mm -hmm. So there we had really hard debates and I'm sure there we will see developments. So we will see new forms of citizen participation coming up and the hard discussions about qualified majority voting uh, and, and so on. So this is a- Let's come to those debate. hard discussions. Uh, Calypso, I, you have put your hand down again. Uh, if you did want to speak, please raise it. Our questions, written questions so from the audience. I mentioned the one about did we think, do we think uh, foreign policy, there will be a move to move to QMB, someone asking about what have they said uh, on fundamental rights uh, and have there been more concrete proposals and someone, Matthias Schiffer is saying, how surprised are you that giving up the Strasbourg seat has not been mentioned by citizens in their recommendation? If I speak to people about Europe, he says, it's the first thing they come up with. For some, the fact that it's not been mentioned in the recommendations proves this whole thing has been manipulated. Lots of comments. You can come back on that in a minute. But I wanted to dive straight into this point now um, of where we go from here. And I say they do link because those questions are about content uh, and what we do. And I just wanted to read you a couple of quotes. First, Ursula von der Leyen on May the 9th said, the message has been received loud and clear. Now it is time to deliver. And the European Parliament President, Roberto Metzola, said, we are at a defining moment of European integration and no suggestion for change should be off limits. But I was very struck that the closing statement when it comes to next steps is rather bland. It simply says, the three institutions will now examine how to follow up effectively on these proposals, each within their own spheres of competence and in accordance with the treaties. Uh, Colin, we've seen this debate already, the letter of the 13 saying you mustn't rush to a premature convention, the parliament saying we must launch the process for a convention, other member states not hitting back, but a, a, a sort of counter letter, if you like, saying that they were open in principle to treaty change. How likely do you think it is? I know you don't want to get hung up on that completely, but it is going to be the hot topic. A lot of our audience questions link to it. Um, how likely do you think it is that some of these proposals that do require fundamental change will be taken up? And what are the consequences if they're not, if anything that requires major change gets ignored? I think, <clears throat> uh, I, I think we're going to need uh, both ambition and realism. In the in the coming weeks, uh, and I think the time between now and the uh, and the European Council in June is going to be rather um, rather crucial in that respect, uh, including because um, we'll see what the Parliament comes up with uh, in the in the coming weeks. The Commission we're preparing our communication, which will be out uh, uh, just before the European Council in in, in June, um, and then the European Council itself is going should be debating whether or not um, to take this next step. Now, um, I, I, and this is a very, very much a personal view rather than a necessarily the Commission's view. Um, I, I genuinely think that this shouldn't be a, a, an all or nothing. Yeah. Because I think we, we, we should bear in mind the fact that, yes, there are some of the things that, that, that some of us want to do that are rather far-reaching, rather ambitious, but those also have a number who are against. Who are not comfortable with going that far. So it would be a terrible shame if by trying to reach for those objectives we end up missing out on everything. Mm. Uh, so I think it, it would be very important that uh, that we, we we try to see whether whether this could be done in stages or this could be done in packets in in such a way that we ensure that what is achievable and on which there is a, a rather broad degree of consensus can be achieved. On the other things, 
let's have a discussion. Let's let's see whether those who are not convinced can be convinced. Whether those who are now convinced can see the other side of the coin as well and see what uh, where the others who are more skeptical or more hesitant uh, are coming from. Um, so I, I would this would be if there is a possibility to uh, to approach things in this in this way. This I think would be um, the way we should try to address it. Thank you very much. Uh, Daniel, your thoughts on this, and I don't know whether you come want to comment on that question about the Strasbourg seat and, and why it didn't come up um, at all. You can pick up on it if you like. <laughs> so so first on the on the 13 countries that say we shouldn't rush it. I mean, if we if we look at the last convention, that's over 20 years ago, right? Uh, it took us several years to, to pass it eventually as the Treaty of Lisbon. And since then, we have seen the financial crisis, we have seen migration, we've seen Brexit, we've seen Corona, and now war has come back to the continent. And in that situation, witnessing all the shortcomings of, of the union and the need for change, it wasn't like we immediately wanted to rewrite the treaties. We said, let's have a debate, a dialogue with citizens for two years, right? That's what we wanted in the parliament. The governments only agreed to one year of, of conference. So we did that. We debated in the conference. Now we have what the citizens and the conference want. And now we're not saying let's now rewrite the treaties or amend the treaties. Now we're saying let's start a convention. So another whatever year or two of debate uh, until we actually have the concrete amendments to the treaties. If we now say that that is rushing it, I think we're in the sphere of political comedy or something. I mean, for me, really, you know, that accusation that we're rushing it, I, I have to say, is a bit bizarre. But what do you um, say, Daniel, just sorry to interrupt, but to, to Colin's fear that if you push too hard on the difficult bits, the bits that require treaty change, for example, you may not get anything. Uh, do you share that concern? No, because ultimately, I mean, the worst thing that can happen is that we get stuck somewhere in the in the process, right? Uh, but, you know, I mean, we, we have passed a major package with the with the seven year budget with the Corona fund and with the rule of law conditionality a year and a half ago. And I think there's three important lessons in in what happened uh, with that package. One is we need a bigger a bigger reform package on the table. I actually think that if we were now just suggesting uh, to change uh, from, from unanimity to qualified majority voting in the area of foreign policy, I think that would be too narrow. And it would be actually more difficult to get unanimous agreement on that rather than having a few things on the table where there's different elements for different countries in it. Second point being money will facilitate the compromise finding. I'm not suggesting let's buy votes uh, of, of, of member states, but if there is an investment package attached to institutional reform, it will go easier. And third, if, if we cannot, or if we cannot immediately bring everyone along, well, let's think if certain elements can be done with a group of member states that does want to move forward. Again, we have seen with the last package that just the, the open reflection on possibly doing the Corona Fund uh, without Poland and Hungary, ultimately brought everyone on board. Mm. So I think with those three elements, there, there is a chance. I, I know we don't have the numbers yet to, to start the convention, but there was not a single government willing to open the treaties a year ago. Now so we're you feel six. the momentum and is with you. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> and you. the big member states are there. And if now Macron and Scholz and Draghi uh, put their full weight behind this and convince some of their their colleagues, I think there's a chance uh, that we'll move in that direction. Thank you. Dominic, just in terms of, I mean, I was quite struck when we had one of our conference conversations, uh, just so Colin and Daniel know, is we had a made up entirely of citizens talking about their experience, but also talking about their expectations. And I was quite struck, A, by how positive they felt about the experience, but also how realistic they seemed to be. When I asked them, will you be disappointed? 
if you don't see all the things you've been calling for happen. They seemed rather pragmatic, Dominic, didn't they, about, uh, well, we'd like to see some of it, but we don't expect them to do everything. Where do you think the balance will lie in terms of citizens feeling this process worked for them, uh, in terms of how much of what they've called for is done? Is there, I mean, is it quantifiable? Is it one or two big headline? You mentioned the proposals in the area of democracy. What will, for the citizens, do you think, make them feel they were heard enough, if not entirely? Well, I believe also the citizens, it's not a coherent group. So it's no. a very, very diverse group of people as well. And some of the citizens, they clearly expect uh, some policies, some proposals to be implemented. And others would say, well, it's been a huge, um, uh, I mean, experience for me. So it was just fantastic. Uh, and uh, it was it was just uh, not just a pleasure. It was an honor to be part of a European wide debate. So that's quite diverse. Um, and also, I think if we're just saying so the conference is a, is a success, if it will lead to treaty change, then of course, so that's not a good thing. So the conference is a success if it will lead to change in a couple of substantial areas. One could be treaty change, yes, but there are a lot of policy proposals on the table. And now I think the, the difficult question is how the institutions are dealing with that. And is it, it is difficult also because of shedding some light and visibility on these processes. Uh, that's quite quite opaque. Yeah, It's very difficult to follow these processes. And this is especially why, why the media, journalists, but also think tankers um, hang on to the question of treaty change. And finally, of course, so the way we do politics on the European level, the way citizens and, and politicians connect with each other, that has to change. The way we do democracy at the EU has to change. And here I believe the, the conference has had an impact and here I expect some changes. So let's not boil it down all just to treaty change. But having said that, I think it's, it's quite uh, enlightening to see while the Commission President and the Parliament President have delivered their speeches on the 9th of May exactly at the same time the ambassadors of uh, of uh, the 13 countries tweeted their opposition to that. So we're entering a new ball game, and this is not just interesting. So it's uh, it's also in that is that respect a new era of um, of institutional debates uh, that 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 has just started. Yanis, just coming back to those questions coming from our audience, uh, the one about foreign policy and do you do you think we'll move to QMB? John Palmer asking, uh, in practical terms, what are the panel's view about whether the union is ready to acknowledge the strong recommendations of the conference to extend EU decision making in areas like health and education? Could these areas in future, for example, see an extension of collective borrowing by the EU to improve standards? What is your feeling about what stands a chance of being taken up among the more difficult issues and what is really not a runner for now, uh, if you have a sense of that already? Sure, um, but let me share three reflections and I'll try to incorporate into them also the points you mentioned. The first reflection is that I think when we talk about treaty change and convention, we have very much in mind what happened in 2002-2003 and also what happened before 2002 and 2003 and thereafter. Um, I think we should liberate our minds a bit of the experience of the past. We could think also of the convention being shorter, quicker, to the point. That requires a different level of preparation. And for those of us who had the experience of the convention, um, I think we can say that when we went into that experiment of the time, the level of preparation was not as thorough as I think it could have been. And if we now think of a convention, I think we need to think of it in a way which is more concrete and prepared accordingly. So for me, for example, I have now stopped saying the word treaty change. I'm talking about treaty changes. It is about what concretely do we want to change of the treaty? And I hope, for example, that the European Parliament will be very concrete in its proposals of treaty change, because that will also get rid of some of the myths which are out there when it comes to changing the treaties. And it would increase the political pressure on those who argue, we don't need to have a discussion which is abstract now about treaty change and reforming the EU, we need to do the concrete stuff. And they're saying that many of them are saying this in order to get around having concrete changes also to the governance structures of the EU. So let's have a different mindset with respect to the convention and prepare it in a different way than we've done in the past. Mm -hmm. Second, um, Colin said realism and ambition. I would say 
what we need to bring together, and that is not easy, in light of where we are now, is unity and ambition. Because we are in a situation which those are on the opposite side of the fence, and I'm now looking towards very much to the east, um, want us to be disunited. This is one of the major objectives they're having. So we need to find a way of being united, while at the same time also ambitious. Um, and here I align myself with, uh, uh, with, with, uh, with Daniel. Um, if you would have asked me uh, two or three or four years or even earlier, I would have said, look, look if you go for uh, treaty changes, is this actually what you really want? It might also backfire. I was always saying we need to be realistically ambitious or ambitiously realistic. Now I think under the pressure of what we are under, we need to be more ambitious. And yes, we also need to rush. Um, because I do not want us to find ourselves in a situation in a couple of years time where we'll be saying why we didn't take the lessons of 2022 as serious as we should have taken them. Yeah. Now we're saying we should have taken the lesson of 2008, the lesson of 2014, and have prepared for what's now happening in 2022. We should not find ourselves in 24 or 25, by the way, when potentially the person sitting in the White House will be another one, and then saying, well, we didn't take the lessons of 22 and did what we had to do. So we are even under operating under time pressure. And the last point, it very much depends on Berlin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It very much depends on how Berlin will be positioning itself. If the position is at the top level of the German government, because we have three coalition partners, Daniel is from one of the three. And if the top level of the German coalition says, well, now is not the right time to get into a discussion about how to change the European Union X, Y, Z, not only policy terms, but also governance terms. If that is the uh, level of, um, of ambition in Berlin, we have a problem because okay. as, and then I'll stop. As, as Daniel told us earlier in 22, the major progress we made with respect to next generation EU was on the basis of an agreement of May 2020 between okay. Paris and Berlin. Sorry, but Yanis, I'm going to have to something equivalent. Because we need to we need to talk a little bit more about how this is going to work and also come back to this point about whether this has changed the way the EU takes its decisions forever. But Daniel and Colin, briefly, if you would, in terms of the next stage, and you talked about a battle over interpretation, uh, Daniel, how do you see, and there have been calls, uh, Yanis was just talking about a change of mindset to prepare the convention, and there is, a uh, point out to you, uh, the EPC published earlier this month, a potential blueprint and a timeline for the way forward in the next phase. Do take a look if you haven't had a chance to read it. How do you see the process working now? There's been suggestions of an ad hoc working group to look at this, uh, to maintain that interinstitutional cooperation that has been a hallmark of this process. Briefly, how do you see that working, How that battle over interpretation? Same question to you and to Colin, and then I'd like to move to the future of participatory democracy. So, I mean, on uh, on legislation, I think this will have to happen in the in the respective committees, yeah. right? That they now basically integrate that in their regular work, and there the ball lies very much well in in the park that that Colin is from, uh, because we we cannot actually do anything about that under the current treaties, where the parliament can do something about it, in in terms of at least initiating procedures is treaty change. And there, uh, the work has started in the in the Constitutional Affairs Committee, and we are presently putting together our interpretation of you know how do we read the conference conclusions and what does that concretely mean? What bits uh, have to be changed in the in the treaty? The the added difficulty, of course, is that. You know, it's not just a, a, a simple translation, you know, this recommendation means you need to change these articles in the treaty, but we also have to think about how can we get the 14 in the in the Council to actually get into the Convention, and there is still different interpretations uh, also as to to how concrete the proposals have to be. Some read Article 48 as a basically amendment format, change these words in that article. Others say more of a you know, we want to change uh, this article to um, better protect the rule of law, for example, and the exact wording to be discussed in the in the convention. Given that Article 48 has not been used ever, 
I guess uh, you know, as 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 always, uh, when when there is an actual agreement among the institutions, we will find a way uh, to to make it work. So it needs a lot of conversation over the coming weeks between the parliament negotiators and the French presidency to see what is something that they feel can get at least 14 votes in the council. And the commission role in all of that, Colin, while you talked about the important time between now and the European Council, um, how do you see your role, the commission's role in this phase uh, and moving forward? Well, I mean, first of all, I, I would make the comment that even if, if the parliament doesn't have the right of initiative enshrined in the treaties, I think over the past few years, we've seen that it can be very, very skillful in encouraging the commission in uh, in where it places its emphasis in uh, in taking initiative so so i think uh, that's something that should also be be taken into account and i think it speaks to the fact that the institutions in reality uh, while we very often talk about the confrontational um uh, approach uh, in, 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 in between the institutions but in reality th there is quite a lot that we are able to do together um, given the different roles that each institution plays, given the different competences that the, that the different institutions have. Um, and I think it would be no difference here. Difference here. Um, I think that now that we're in this kind of reflection phase where each institution is looking now at what comes next, I think we all realize that while we're doing this reflection individually, you know, the next steps we're going to have to do together. Because whether it's legislation and you know, decision making in the classic sense, that's something we need to do together. If we, even if we are going to move to uh, to the convention and to and to treaty change, that is also something we're going to have to do together. So um, the the reality is that you know, if you like, we could say we're stuck with each other, and uh, and we need to make sure that we find the best way in which to take this forward. Including because I think that uh, one thing that's been striking about this process is that a year ago when we started out, I think the three institutions had very different visions of what this was going to be about or what it should be about. I think today, a year later, our views are actually far closer to one another than they were a year ago. It's true that we still tend to emphasize the differences because th those are the ones we have to deal with where we agree it's easy, we can move on. Uh, but the reality is that I think this has also been a very interesting um, uh, exercise in interinstitutional activity let's call it activity at this stage, um, because uh, I think it is it is unprecedented in the manner in which it has been conducted. Um, and, and I hope that we continue to, to use this kind of approach and we continue to experiment even more um, in, in this in this way. Thank you. Colin, just picking up on that and moving to, to the last issue I wanted to discuss with you. Uh, that's been unprecedented. The whole process, as you said, all of you said at the beginning, this experiment in bringing the citizens together with the politicians uh, for these discussions has been unprecedented. Uh, I've asked this question in many of our sessions, so I'm not going to ask um, Yanis and Dominic to comment on this, but many people who I've spoken to in conference conversations have said, you can't go back now. This has changed the way the EU does business forever uh, and that some form of participatory democracy needs to become a continual feature there has been and i mentioned it earlier uh, a high level advisory group the conference observatories high level advisory group has put forward some proposals uh, and dominic mentioned earlier a key raft of the proposals from the citizens indeed are about increased citizen participation in democracy whether it be citizens assemblies eu-wide referenda or so on uh, for each of you, and perhaps Colin, I'll come to you first this time because you're talking about unprecedented there. Do you believe this has changed the way we do business forever? Can the genie be put back in the bottle? The, the very short answer is is yes, things have changed. And I think um, we can we can look at the at the speech delivered by President von der Leyen, where she said very specifically that uh, the Commission will be using citizens' panels from now on um, to deliberate on key legislative initiatives. Um, the, you know, it, it, we, we can see how this could link in to initiatives which are announced at the State of the Union address, um, how the Commission Work Programme is uh, is devised. And by the way, even that, the Commission Work Programme is something we do jointly with the European Parliament. Um, you know, so the, 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 what, what, we, what we would be doing here is bringing the citizen component, uh, the citizen aspect, if you like, into into the way that we 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 we, we conduct our business, um, and I think the main reason for that is that it we've seen that it it works. Now, one of the things that what was mentioned very often by the skeptics is 
um, how, how, how really random is the selection of, of these citizens. And there are many allegations about people being chosen um, because they were pro-European, etc. And, and I have to say that this is absolute rubbish because if we look at, the, at the, uh, the, the citizens that participated in this process, the 800 or so who participated in this process, there were many, many dissenting voices. Now, one of the things that I, I, I would I'd like to quote one of the co-chairs, Mr. Verhofstadt, who often said that this whole thing about dividing Europe into uh, Europhiles and Eurosceptics is very much a Brussels thing. And I think he's very, very right. Because when you talk to regular people, most of them, you know, they... They don't necessarily love the European Union, but they actually love a number of the benefits that it brings with them, but it brings with it. And they can be extremely critical. There are a number of things that they would like to change. They would like us to communicate better. They would like to, us to explain better. But ultimately, they acknowledge that overall, it's a good thing. It's something that has been beneficial to their lives. Um, and this is something that the skeptics tend to, you know, it sticks in their craw. They, they, they can't accept this. That, uh, that that regular people feel feel this way. And this was very much the message we got from these citizens' panels. It was critical, but critical in a in a constructive sense. Mm, thank you very much. Um, Dan, and in fact, your comment about um, the representation, and we do have a question from the audience, which you've answered really, from Christian Ekreiner, who said, is there any information about the kind of people who took part in the process? He was worried about, is there any sign of a clear bias? You're saying no. It was a rigorous process. It did work effectively. Uh, Daniel, um, from your perspective, a future, I mean, there are some uh, of those who are involved in representative democracy, uh, elected politicians who are wary or have been wary of participatory democracy and its role in the democratic process. Do you think this has changed perceptions of it? And do you think it has altered the way we're going to go forward when we have future discussions on policy directions? I think so. Uh, I think the the experience of everyone I have spoken to in the in the conference plenary was was very positive of of how this worked. I haven't met any of the of the members of the European Parliament or indeed the national parliaments that felt that that they are being replaced or anything that we're just using citizens panels in the future and we no longer need parliaments. So I think uh, on on that account it has been very positive. I would be very much in favor of, of using, I mean, not the, the whole conference setup, but that we use dedicated citizens panels on, on big pieces of legislation in the, in the future. Because I think this tool as some kind of focus group uh, on, on, on what citizens expect and what they would prefer can, can really help us to, to better legislate. But the question whether we will ever motivate any citizen to participate in a process like this ever again, as, as Yanis has indicated before, hinges a bit on the question whether we now manage to deliver anything on this, because, you know, the next invitation citizens will naturally ask, so what are you going to do with this? And if, if anyone has realized that there was the conference on the future of Europe and that nothing came from it, well, why should I ever participate in, in yes. such an exercise ever again? Absolutely. Uh, Dominic and Yanis, uh, one of the things you have produced together, a study, Bertelsmann and Stifton and the EPC, a study entitled Under Construction Citizen Participation in the European Union. And you've been looking at the sort of instruments that are out there, a uh, patchwork, you call it, uh, and saying, we need to move to something more with more of an infrastructure. Dominic, how do you see the way ahead? Briefly, if you would, because I want to put you all on the spot before we close. But Dominic. Briefly about our 200. I know. Study. I know it's yeah. impossible. <laughs> so, so, so look, I mean, one of the results is, is the one you mentioned. I mean, there is there is a plethora of instruments out there. And uh, on the EU level, we've got even more citizen participation instruments than on many than in many member states. But still, I mean, it's a, it's a patchwork of instruments that it doesn't really lead up to a participation infrastructure where people really know what to do, where to go to, and what happens with their results. Uh, and I think this needs to change. And in the context of that, citizens as uh, panels, of course, they, they have their value, but it is not just about 
now doing citizens panels over and over again on key legislative uh, issues. No, it's it's about combining citizens panels with something else. Uh, and we evaluated all those existing uh, instruments through the lens of, of six criteria, and they are visibility, accessibility, representativeness, deliberativeness, transnationality, and of course, policy impact. And through these lenses, I think we've got to develop a, a participatory infrastructure, but an infrastructure that is jointly developed by all institutions. And we were talking about the interinstitutional cooperation. And of course, Colin was just quoting the head from the European Parliament faction, so Guy Verhofstadt. So overall, that worked well. But there was, of course, also some sort of interinstitutional non cooperation. Not, not all member states were really willing to join the camp. Uh, and here I'm with Yanis, so it is it is about unity in that process as well. But I'm also with Colin. Uh, I see that cultural change within the institutions. Uh, I, I see it definitely within the Commission. I see it within the Parliament, and I hope uh, that member states will follow. Bear with me, apologies. Uh, that point about visibility, uh, we don't have time to delve into it, but Clements Oswald in our audience also saying, uh, you know, is there a problem? How can we deal with the lack of awareness? How can, is there a problem with media coverage concerning soft participation issues? Uh, Yanis, uh, briefly from your point of view, this patchwork to an infrastructure, what's key for you? I think that Dominic said um, already a lot of things. We will have to improve the existing instruments. Um, I think we need to add um, new elements uh, into how we conduct citizens participation. Um, we have been discussing about this uh, proposal, which Ursula von der Leyen took up with respect to key legislative proposals, but there are also other moments in the EU policy making process where citizens participation, I think, can play a positive role. And you look at, have to look into each and every one of these uh, potential moments um, and develop a, a system which is um, developed on its own to suit the purpose. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's what makes it also difficult. But then again, um, this has been an experiment. What we will do in the future will also in many ways be an experiment because developing EU democracy and thus including also citizens elements into that is a very long term process. Absolutely. Uh, we are almost out of time. But Daniel, uh, just by way, I was going to ask you for a, a priority to make this process work. But I think given what we've discussed, we've highlighted what are the most important issues for you. So let me come back to this question. Uh, Yanis said at the beginning, uh, we can't evaluate yet. I asked you for your impressions of the process uh, and what has emerged. And Yanis said too early. Uh, we need to see what happens at the end, what will happen to the proposals uh, and the future of citizens' participation. But for you, what will define for you the overall success or failure of this really quite remarkable experiment we've seen over the last year? Same question to you all. Daniel, then Colin, uh, then Yanis, and I'll finish with Dominic. Daniel. I think actually we can evaluate what has happened so far, because in a way now the responsibility is also off the conference and on the EU institutions to do something with it. So if it fails now, it's not the conference's fault. It's that, you know, the EU institutions as they exist today, then apparently would be incapable of, of, of reform, right? Uh, I, I, I hope they aren't. I, I very much hope that the EU is capable of reform. Um, but but the, the conference, I think, I mean, the success I see in, the citizens that have participated and all these civil society representatives and so on rather being happy of of the process they feel like they could contribute uh, and and anyone i have spoken to is quite happy and proud with with the outcome so mm -hmm. i think if you take that as a measure uh good if there is something to improve well we're we're back with the governments in the absolutely in the Very that's, good point. that's where where attendance was lowest and uh you know that also distanced themselves the most from from the outcome of the conference thank you so much colin you're muted at the moment sir My microphone Sorry, uh, I, I'd agree pretty much with what with what Daniel said. Maybe just to add a little bit more. I think one one other measure that would be very important is is how capable we are we are of of giving feedback, because I think one of the the, the areas where the institutions have have not been uh, at the top of their game is 
in, in explaining how we work and what we do and, and, and communicating about it. And I think here we have an opportunity. There's actually a demand. I think that, that the citizens here are uh, keen to follow up on what, what is being done with their proposals, with the proposals of the conference. And we need to be able to explain um, both what we're doing, when we're doing it, but also when we're not going to do something, we need to say why. And, it, and I think that that perhaps is the most important part of it all, uh, explaining why not. Uh, and giving cogent reasons for that and explaining in a way that is that is you know understandable uh, to people and and i think if, uh, if if there is satisfaction among citizens among civil society on the level of feedback given that will itself i think be a, a very important measure thank you very much janice the thing to ask for in one word is delivery it's deliver in terms of policy reforms and in governance reforms um, and if you ask me about delivery, that needs in the context of the conference process. It's not about the conference itself, but the process of the conference. Um, Daniel was saying he still hopes that the Council, European Council in June will get to 14 votes. I have my doubts. But what we then have to do is not take the all or nothing approach, but say, what do we do if we don't get the 14? And we need to put pressure on the system to make sure that we progress in terms of delivery. Um, we have come forward, as you were describing earlier, uh, with a proposal of what we think needs to be done, because we need to increase pressure so that in four, six, nine months down the road, we will have the level of progression we need in order to deliver. Uh, because there is a danger that in six months' time, the actual pressure will be even less than it's today. And that is a bit of a paradoxon, a paradoxon between Zeitenwende and the level of ambition we're witnessing at the current point in time. Thank you very much. Dominic, briefly, if you would, you have the final word. Oh, what a responsibility. So, <laughs> uh, look, I mean, you often refer to the glass half full. I think at the beginning of the conference, it was half full with water. Now we've got something more substantial, substantial in it. So that's good. But still, I would say at times, the conference felt for me as someone who, who's been doing citizen participation for a while as an extremely technocratic and consensus oriented exercise. And uh, so that was OK. And I think we've learned a lot. But we also have to learn how to deal with conflicts and how to deal with completely opposing views. Uh, and this, I mean, we're living in, 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 in a situation where we still have that in Europe and we've got to deal with this conflict and opposing views. And I'm, I'm not that sure how much we learned so far with the conference and we need to think a little bit more about that. Thank you very much. That is all we have time for. I wish we could go on talking. Apologies to those whose questions who were, were, which were more specific that I didn't manage to squeeze in. Uh, but I'm very grateful to you all. Just to remind you, if you haven't looked at it already, do take a look at the High Level Advisory Group's report, which looks at those different options, different ways in which the participation instruments could be used in the future and under what circumstances. I mentioned the potential blueprint and timeline uh, that the EPC published published for the next steps earlier this month, and that study under construction by the Bertelsmann Stiftung and the EPC, uh, looking at how to build that infrastructure that Yanis and Dominic were talking about. But thank you so much, particularly Colin, Daniel, thank you so much for being with us this afternoon. Great discussion. This one, as they say, will run and run. But for now, thank you all very much indeed, and goodbye. <laughs>